Good evening, citizens of Portsmouth, and welcome to our public work session. Also, welcome to my colleagues on council and Madam Clerk. Would you call the roll, please? Vice Mayor Barnes. Mr. Battle. Here. Mrs. Lucasburg. Here. Mr. Moody. Here. Dr. Whitaker. Mr. Woodard. Here. Mayor Glover. Here. Thank you, ma'am. We will now turn the meeting over to our interim city manager, Ms. Mimi Terry. Madam, you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor, uh, absent vice mayor, council members, uh, city of Portsmouth representatives, and family. Um, I don't know what that noise is. Our first presentation will be with John Hancock. Um, and Greystone will be presenting for our legacy retirement system update. And our first speaker is Ms. Patty Phillips. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and members of Council. Uh, I'm here just to kind of give you an overview of uh, today's presentation. Uh, Mr. Landon Moore, who is the Retirement Board's chair, will uh, give you an overview, and then uh, John Hancock will give you information on the funded status of the retirement systems, and then uh, Greystone Consulting will give you a status of the investments. So I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Moore. Good afternoon, Mr. Moore. Good and afternoon, welcome. Mr. Mayor. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here in person. It's been a while since. Uh, been able to present in person. I um, <clears throat> just uh, I'm just going to give a few uh, background on a, a few slides here um, on the history of the plan and the, the current status. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been on the board since 2017. Uh, most recently, been the chair for the last couple of years. Um, I also, in my professional career, look after. Uh, pension plan plans for uh, for a corporation. So um, uh, I have quite a bit of experience in um, managing pension plans. If you could, uh, sub uh, could you could you talk one? into the mic a little more, sir? We can't really hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Um, if you could uh, switch to the first slide. Mm -hmm. So this is a. Uh, overview of the last 10 years of the the pension plan you can see the um, the bump there in 2013 and the funded status from when the pension obligation bonds were were issued uh, since then the funded status has been fairly stable uh, with the exception of the last uh, 2021 we did have exceptional returns in the um, investments, which bumped the fund status up to 86 percent. Um, I'd say that this is, is a pretty healthy position and in line with, with peers. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, that was, uh, that was as of the end of fiscal 2021. Currently, uh, as of March this year, uh, the latest numbers are we're at 78 percent funded with the market value of the assets of 227 million. Uh, the average funded status for public re retirement plans is around 75 percent. So we are uh, sort of right in line with, with other uh, municipalities. Um, I'll also point out that on an annual basis, our actuary, uh, John Hancock, which is going to speak later, uh, calculates an annual required contribution um, for the plan. That is expected to be for 2023 around seven to eight million and I'll just um, make the comment that um, you know because of the decision to uh, issue the the pension obligation bonds uh, and the city's commitment to contributing uh, on an annual basis to this fund has uh, been the reason we achieved the the 75 percent fund of status that we are now and I, I'd say that's a healthy position to be in. Next slide, please. Um, 
So these, uh, as a reminder, these are legacy plans uh, of the police and fire system. Uh, the board also looks after a uh, OPEB trust, which is a, uh, a pool trust in the state of Virginia to support uh, post-retirement health care benefits. Um, we have quarterly meetings where we uh, review both the investments and the liabilities with our uh, two partners, Greystone and John Hancock. Um, our board consists of seven members, um, which is represented by uh, fire and police, as well as um, unaffiliated members such as myself, which have uh, financial investment experience. Uh, we also have the two um, staff members that attend meetings as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a list of the board members. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, go through all of this, but I'll, I'll um, name the board members myself. David Holly is the vice chair, Danny Covey, Mark Gardner, Joel Hawkins, who's in attendance, um, Stephanie Elliott Williams, and Karen Savage. We also have, the, as I mentioned, the ex officio members and, uh, and the others listed there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a little bit of background on our uh, partners that help manage uh, this, these plans. Um, I'll just, you'll hear from them later uh, following, following my comments, but I, I would just say that these are both uh, first class institutions and um, are highly reputable large companies with tons of institutional knowledge on uh, investing and managing pension liabilities. Um, I think we're in very good hands with, with who we have um, as our partners to help manage this plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, th this slide is just a little bit more background on the, the two plans. Um, the retirement plan has achieved 11.7% uh, returns on the investments since we made the switch to discretionary investment management from Greystone. Um, also, uh, the, the general fund of the city uh, has sort of two ongoing um, commitments to service the debt on those pension obligation bonds of roughly $10.9 million a year. Uh, and also to, uh, to uh, contribute the annual contribution as, as calculated by the actuary. Um, that's run in the neighborhood of, of 10 million also, so about $20 million a year to, um, to service this plan. The healthcare plan uh, has been on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, recently, the city put I believe it was $6 million into a pooled uh, trust managed by um, VML VACO, uh, which currently stands at $7.2 million. Next slide, please. Um, that concludes my comments. I'm going to turn it over to um, Andre Stewart, unless, unless we have questions. I can, I can answer or we can... Uh, Move on to John Hancock. Thanks. Welcome, Andre. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. I want to, but this is, you can control the oh, okay. presentation. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, members of council. Good to be with you once again. I'm going to start my section of the presentation with a brief overview of the membership of the systems. As you can see, there are very few current employees benefiting from the system, uh, 14 current members. So the system, as well as the contributions that the city makes on an annual basis, is primarily for the benefit of former employees, and that's fairly typical for pension plans at large. While Mr. Landon 
um, I'm sorry, while well, Mr. Moore provided you with some context for the historical funded status, I'm going to present the current funded status and some recent movement in the funded status. So on this slide, we can see side by side the market value as well as the liabilities of the system. And then to the right, the funded status expressed both as dollar values as well as a percentage. So we can see, in fis and this is for fiscal 2021, on the next slide we'll take a look at the first nine months of fiscal 2022. We can see from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, the funded status improved from 69% to 86%, and that's largely based on the very strong investment performance during that period, around 25% return. And that's in comparison to the actuarial expectation of 7.25%. We've set that as a long-term expected return on assets uh, for the systems. Obviously, there are going to be years we overperform and underperform. Fiscal year, fiscal year 2021 was a very strong year for return, so outperformed our actuarial expectations and really led to a higher funded status than was the case at the beginning of the year. But I'm going to call your attention to two other items besides just the funded status. First, the benefit payments that are being made from the plan, $30 million every year. And that's pretty significant in relation to the size of the assets. About 14% of the assets are being distributed every year. So what we've seen and what we would expect, even in years where the assets perform as we anticipate, that the asset level may actually decline just because there's so much asset outflow uh, in, the, in terms of those benefit payments that it's hard to support that outflow just on investment return as well as contribution. So even when you see the asset levels declining, doesn't necessarily mean that investments aren't performing as we expected, as well as contributions to the plan being made as expected. And that transitions well to the next uh, item I want to call your attention to, and that's the contributions from the city. $13.7 million in fiscal 2021. I've been the actuary for the system since 2010, and during that time, there has not been a year where the city has not made a contribution, at least in the amount that I've recommended, and in, in certain years, it's actually exceeded that amount. And you can see the $13.7 million is in excess of what I recommended of $9 million in fiscal 2021. So those are my main takeaways from that slide. Turning to the current fiscal year through March of 2022, the most recently available information, investment returns. That's what's really going to uh, influence the funded status on an annual basis. As I mentioned, there are going to be years where the investments overperform or underperform our expectations in 2022. So far, it's underperformed our expectations. But over the long term, investments have actually been in, in excess of the 7.25% bogey we've, ex, we've, we've uh, set for the plan. So the funded status declined from the 86% to 78%. 78 uh, and just for some context, w shortly after the pension obligation bond was implemented, we ran some proge proge projections, excuse me, in 2013. And those projections, we, in those projections, we estimated that the funded status in 2022 would be 75% for the systems. So even taking into account the recent challenges in the market, the plan and the funded status is actually ahead of what we anticipated shortly after the pension obligation bonds were floated. Just a few closing comments. So the contributions that we've anticipated, uh, the, the contribution level is expected to be about seven to eight million dollars across the two systems. That's in line with recent uh, contribution levels. During that time, as you've seen evidenced by the, the previous slide, the funded status is really going to increase or decrease in line with the investment returns. We have a good idea of what the liabilities will do. That may differ by one or two percentage points based on how long people live. 
So it's really going to be the investment performance that's going to dictate the funded status. I talked about the, the significance of the benefit payments in relation to the asset levels and how that can appear to drain the asset or, or drain the assets, um, but that's coming out of the assets as well as the liability. So while the funded status as a percentage may decline, the dollar value is going to be the, the dollar value of the assets and liability is going to decline in equal amounts. Uh, and then lastly, this last bullet, it says that the current funding method will drive the systems to 100%. The funded method is really a system that I use to determine the contributions on an annual basis that the city should make. Um, and it uh, will dictate that the contributions, along with the investments, will drive the plans to 100% funded by year 2037. The way I look at that is what the investments don't do the city is going to be expected to do in terms of contributions, right? The funding for the plan has to, is going to come from one of two, well, two sources. Either the investments, if the investments perform better than expected, then the city has to make fewer contributions. If the investments underperform our expectations, the city will have to make more contributions. So it's going to come from a combination of those two sources. You just don't know how much or who's going to bear more of that burden. So that brings me to the end of my prepared remarks. Any questions or comments? Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Phillips. Uh, Andre, um, I, I, I do have a question. Um, so based on what, what you all are seeing in the market today, what, what would be your recommendation? I, I know that you know, interest rates have, have risen and other things are happening. So what, what is the preferred course based on your information? Yeah, so I'm going to leave that to Greystone since they are your investment managers. My right. focus is really on the liabilities. Right. And as a uh, governmental plan, the, the, while there's been a lot of movement in interest rates, interest rates on the li don't really impact the liabilities as it does a corporate plan where the liabilities are actually pegged to those interest rates. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart. The uh, question I have is in regards um, to the uh, contributions from the city, and that m that may be for um, our you know city manager to address. On page ten, where the contribution from the city is thirteen point um, seven million, and if I understand. Mr. Stewart, correctly, you had recommended nine million. So that that four point seven million difference, where did that come from? Uh, hello again. Uh, the difference is because in twenty eighteen we refinanced the pension obligation bonds and we had a savings and I'm going from memory, roughly $9 million, and we spread those savings back into the plan. Okay. So in the future, you'll see the contribution from the city go back down. Okay, so these were not actual dollar amounts coming from the city as a contribution that uh, represents that difference? Uh, that's right. Okay, okay. okay. Mr. Battle, sir, you have the floor. When we uh, made the loan to bring the um, system back up to sovereignty, how much was that loan? It was uh, about $186 million. $186 million. Right. And what was in the system before the loan? I'd have to get you that exact number, but I would expect it was probably less than $50 million. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, he says he can get it for you. Using the uh, information that Mr. Moore presented. That first slide. Make a swag at it. There you go. So it looks like it was in the seventy to eighty million dollar range of cost of plans. Big about seventy to eighty million in that range. Oh, okay. Um, you can see on the graph right there. 
when those bonds were issued and the money went into the system, what the funded status went up rapidly. And uh, in fact, the total amount in the system in 2013 was about uh, over 250 million. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are the expenditures for Greystone for the two organizations? I, I will get that for you. Uh, per year, each yeah, yeah. separately. A yes, ma'am. Abso absolutely, I've got that. Or is it done quarterly? Do they get that quarterly or well, yearly? No, it, I'm going to give you an annual number, but it's paid approximately quarterly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is the, the chart, I believe, that you want. And there are uh, Greystone investment. We, we broke it between the two plans and then totaled it. As you know, there are two systems, the fire and police yes. pension system yes, and the supplemental plan. Yes, ma'am. And the total amount paid to Greystone annually is $226,327. No, I'm, I'm getting it. Okay, the amount paid to John Hancock annually is 149614 on that chart. Now, what it does not include is the amount paid to investment managers. That doesn't get paid to John Hancock. Well, so even if the city invested the money, you'd have to pay investment fund managers. What I'm after is the total expenditures whoever they pay it to, quarterly or yearly. Okay, this is annual payments to Greystone no, and no, John no. Hancock. But you said that they were not the only. So what I'm saying again, if they are the only two, then that's what I want. Right. But if there are other well, expenditures associated with the investments, what, what, are what they? I'm saying is each fund that you buy, for example, I'm going to pick a fund because I don't think that the uh, system uh, invests in BlackRock. BlackRock has fund expenses. Each fund has expenses that doesn't pass through, and we think that's probably around 800000 a year. And I understand BlackRock. I understand Greystone and the other organization. Right. I'm saying what are the total expenditures that we give whoever we're giving funds to for investing or dealing with the total Okay, system. about a, about a million two. Quarterly? No, annually, not quarterly. About? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I took the expense slide because the uh, consultants didn't feel comfortable talking about their own fees, so I did that. <laughs> uh, this slide is, is very short right here, and this is just to remind everybody there are two pension systems, they have slightly different benefits. Uh, both of them are closed. The fire and police was closed in 1995, and the supplemental was closed in November of 1984. And so all current hires go into the Virginia retirement system. And there's a little bit down there about uh, the benefits. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Greystone, Brian Beermom, and uh, his associate, uh, Jim Whitley. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Beerbaum. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council. It's a pleasure to be here with you in person. It's been a while since uh, I've been before this group, but I'm happy to be back. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to answer your question. Um, there's a slide that I think it fits nicely into to talk about some of the things we've been doing from an investment perspective um, over the last nine months. Um, but if um, if you will, I'd, I'd like to run through a, a few slides um, before we get to that. Um, Greystone is the um, investment consulting, institutional investment consulting um, group 
within Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, maybe Greystone a little bit less. Um, when I use the term institutional, what I mean is we work with organizations that look an awful lot like you, public retirement systems, corporate pension plans, endowments, foundations. This is the core of our business, and we work with about $425 billion in assets of institutional investors like yourself. Uh, what we do in our work with the retirement board is to come up with a customized asset allocation strategy and investment strategy, put the portfolio together in a way that's likely to generate the best risk-adjusted returns for the retirement system so we can ultimately lower the cost of providing the benefits to our beneficiaries. That, at a very high level, is what we do. As you can imagine, there's a lot that goes in underneath that. We're happy to talk about it. But at a high level, we create a strategy. We look for firms to invest the assets on behalf of the city. We monitor results and report on results in a very transparent way. Um, we work with the retirement board in what is referred to as a discretionary investment mandate. So what does that mean? The retirement board retains the responsibility of giving us the parameters around which we can invest the portfolio. And by that, what I mean, what is our target asset allocation to stocks and bonds broadly and a range around those targets in which we can operate so that when things happen in the capital markets like we're going through today, where there's volatility, risk, and ultimately opportunities, we can manage the portfolio in such a way to minimize the impact of the volatility and then ultimately generate the returns coming out. We have that ability. We report back to the retirement board on what we've done. In addition to that, if there is a part of the portfolio that is not performing as expected, um, we have the discretion and the authority to replace that manager without going to the retirement board and reporting on that. And we have a lot of conversation around what's going on before we get to that point, but it's our decision um, and uh, discretion to replace anything in the portfolio that's not working. Before I move to the next slide, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. And I did this the first time I was in, in front of the, the city council, um, but I think it's important because it's relevant. I've been at Greystone Consulting for about six years. I joined in 2016. Prior to that, I was the head of public funds consulting for an organization called Mercer Investment Consulting. Mercer is the largest investment consulting firm in the world. I headed up the work we did for public retirement systems across the country. And just to share with you a few names um, that I called um, clients of mine, I worked with the state of Florida, Colorado, um, Ohio, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. And I tell you this because we're very experienced, we're very familiar with the context in which um, the retirement board and the city is um, trying to invest these trust fund assets. Um, and I think it's really important um, that, um, particularly in environments like today, um, that you have somebody that who's, this isn't their first rodeo. And, and this is not, trust me, our first rodeo. I've been in this industry coming up on 30 years now. Um, Mr. Mayor, here's where I'm going to um, get to your um, question. Um, here is a snapshot of how the portfolio looked as of March 31st of 2022. We have a um, long-term target, so all else being equal, if we didn't have any views or perspective on certain areas of the market looking more attractive or risky than others, our target to stocks is 70%. Our target to bonds is 25%, and our target to alternative investments, and in here is mostly real estate, high quality core real estate. Our target to alternative investments is 8%. You can see at the end of March, we were slightly different than what those long-term targets are. In fact, we were at about 68% in equities, slightly underweight um, to uh, stocks, and we were 10 percentage points in alternative investments, things like real estate, slightly overweighted um, to alternative investments. That's been a good decision and a good place to be. Now, I will tell you, um, a lot of folks in our position 
tend not to make changes to the portfolio. They just let the markets happen to them. We made changes in February. We got a little bit more conservative. In fact, we had a higher allocation to equities than the 70% target. And then we pulled back on that equity allocation in February. Um, we pulled back further, which is not reflected in this chart here, um, in equity exposure at the end of May and the beginning part of June. So yes, we have a lot invested in equities, but we've been very active in terms of our uh, reducing exposure. Uh, and importantly, with markets down 20% or so on the year, we didn't wait for markets to be 20% down to reduce exposure. We took advantage when markets were down 5 or 10% to reduce exposure because we, we felt that there were risks on the horizon that we, could, um, that we wanted to protect some of the trust fund's capital with. And those moves have been very successful. We'll talk about results in a second, but Mr. Mayor, I hope that answers your question. Here are the results, um, historical plan year results um, going back to 2013. So the way to read this table is at the top where it says 2013, 2014, et cetera, all the way down to 2021, and the corresponding number to the right, those are the net investment returns for the 12-month period ending June 30th of the year that's identified on the left-hand side. So, for example, in the row that says 2021, that is the 12-month return ending June 30, 2021, 29.5%. Now, when Andre was up here, he mentioned that he uses um, an estimate or an assumption when he does his forecasts of seven and a quarter percent expected return on plan assets. We don't expect um, to be able to generate seven and a quarter percent each and every year. Some years will be better, some years will be worse. But you can see over the last, what is that, uh, eight or nine years, most of the time the return net of all fees that's been generated has been greater than seven and a quarter percent. On the bottom, we look at the um, annualized returns over different time periods. So instead of saying for each plan year, we say what has the return been over the last three, five, and nine year periods, ending June 30 of 2021. I now show you more recent data and information in a second. Um, those returns, in each case, have been in excess of seven and a quarter percent. In fact, if you go over the nine-year period um, of 9.1 percent return per year over the last nine years, higher than the seven and a quarter percent um, assumed rate of return on a cumulative basis, so that's per year, we did not quite two percentage points better. But when you add it all up, it amounts to 30% cumulative higher returns that have been generated than what is assumed to be the case. And again, these are net of all fees. My last slide, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions. Um, I, I wanted to give you more current data and information because I know there's a lot going on in the world. And um, I, I wanted to, to kind of show you how things are looking for the current plan year, which at the end of March of this year, we're about nine months through um, the current plan year. We started um, the year at about $254 million in assets. Um, we had, um, with city contributions and benefit payments that are being made over that nine month period, cash going out of 13.7 million now we had negative investment earnings because the stock market's down, the bond market's down, pretty much all capital markets are down. And again, we don't ever expect we're gonna be able to hit that seven and a quarter each and every year. This is gonna be one of those years where we're not gonna hit the seven and a quarter. Not because of bad investments, but because of what the market is doing. We're down about $12.7 million 
gives us a market value at the end of um, uh, March of uh, 227, not, not quite $228 million. We're down about 5% in the first nine months of the year, uh, of the plan year. When you extend the period away from the current plan year, three years, and I'll focus on this period from 2016, which is when we really got involved with the city. Um, the market value at the beginning of our time in working with the city was about $88 million. And we had cash flow um, coming in of a positive $43.5 million. Um, the investment earnings on this plan from the results and, and the, the, a lot of the decisions that the retirement board had made, $96 million over that, what is that for, six, almost six year period. Um, and I think it's important to put um, that 9.4% return that we've generated over that period into a little bit of context. Davenport, who I know is the city's financial advisor, um, came up with an estimate of the interest costs on the pension obligation bonds being 2.63%. So you're paying 2.63% on the pension obligation bonds. You're earning 9.4% on the assets. That's a really good place to be. So I don't want to dismiss the fact that markets are tough. We've been active. We've been making changes to the portfolio. The retirement board has been incredibly engaged with what's going on and the things we're doing. Um, but 2.6% on the, on the debt service, 9.4% earning on the assets. Again, it's a, it's a good outcome. With that, I'll, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Dr. Whitaker, so you have the floor. Yes, um, is it Mr. Brim Brimbaugh. Brimbaugh. Um, on page 19, where you're giving the um, performance, yes, 4.8 percent. For example, on page 10, is that saying 4.8 percent of what the market value of the assets or? Yes, so these returns are based on the market value of the assets. So okay. the assets that we have that we are responsible for investing um, and the returns that are generated, that's what that represents. Okay, correctly. so so when you, um, when you take 4.8% of the uh, 211 million, um, that, that comes out to something like 10 million. So in, in 2020, the market value was a different number than what we're showing here. Um, so the 211 million isn't the market value of the assets? Let me see, hang on. Yeah, so the 211 million that's shown on page 10. Mm -hmm. That was as of June 30 of 2020. So that was, right, so if I were to put the market value, add the market value in on this table, the 211.6 million would show up in the 2020 column. Right, so the 4.8% return, is that what that's representing and on your column on page 19? So the, um, you would need the market value as of 630 of 2019 to be able to tie those two numbers together. And I don't know what that number is off offhand. Okay, so on page 10, that's not the market value as of June 30th, 2020? It is the market value as of June 30th, 2020. But the 4.8% would have been, on this slide that I'm showing here, is the 12-month return ending June 30 of 2020. So that four, whatever those dollars were, 4.8 as a percent of what the market value was at the, be, at the end of um, the plan year 2019, not, not the end of the plan year 2020. Okay, so then that 7.8% would be the figure for June 30th, 2020, is that what you're saying? Um, no. Um, well, I guess where, where I'm trying to get clarity is yeah. that when you have the return figures up here, percentages, and then you say it's based on market value. Correct. Trying to tie in then how are you coming up with 
$159.5 million. Is that a gross figure, a net figure? I'm it's, not net, it's net of all fees. So Correct. Sorry, I, sorry, I misunderstood what, what you were saying. So let me let me go back here. I think it. So the twelve month return ending June thirtieth of twenty twenty one was twenty nine point five percent net of all fees. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to come back and hopefully tie that twenty nine and a half percent number together. Okay. So. Uh, so, so the 29 and a half corresponds return to the corresponds 59. to 211. Yeah. Correct. And, okay. it, and that 29 and a half percent, I, I hope, is going to be reasonably close. It doesn't quite work this way, but um, that 29 and a half percent corresponds to $59.5 million. Okay. All right. And that 59.5, you say, is a net? Net of all fees. Correct. Okay. Listen. Councilwoman Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barenbaugh, for the presentation. Um, and looking at the historical plan uh, performances on page 19, and our citizens are looking at this, and our retirees are looking at this. Um, during the years um, 2015 and 16, those um, net investment returns were really low. Correct. Um, you know, what attributed to, to that and how did it affect the city's contributions um, during that time? That was before our time. Okay. Um, and I would say the portfolio looked very different back then than the way it does today. Right. We made a dramatic amount of changes to become more diversified, um, to invest in area of areas of the market that were much more likely to generate higher returns. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of that work in working with the retirement board in 2016. And that's why since then you see a dramatic um, increase in results. But I would agree with you when you go back to some of these old, um, uh, uh, older years, some of the results don't look that great. And we observed that too. And when we got engaged with the city, that's why we made a lot of the changes we did. Okay. And then um, for our citizens and our retirees who are looking at this, a lot of times we get questions on if there's an opportunity for retirees to get more money or increased, um, you know, payments in their um, retirement receipts. Um, you know, what does that look like? If somebody's looking at this, they thinking, you know, the city has a lot of money to, to give out. Can we increase the um, um, amount that we give or what does this actually um, what are we telling our citizens and our retirees who are looking at these bottom line figures? Well, I, I would tell you that the most important thing to look at is the funded status of the plan. Um, and right now, I, um, we're at 75% or so. The magic number for public retirement systems is around 80% because that represents um, it, it's, um, it, it's commonly held to be the, the, the metric that everybody shoots for. Nobody wants to, believe it or not, um, uh, nobody really wants to get to 100% funded because um, that presents some challenges in negotiating um, benefits and, and those sorts of things. But 80% is that real um, you know, target that everybody shoots for. And I would say that we're close, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And we still have, um, and I know that two of the plans are closed and we just have the VR, VRS now. So when all of the retirees are paid out of that system, what happens? Then everything is just funded through the VRS system? C correct. Okay. There, there's a small number of active participants in um, both plans these days. There, we, we still have a lot of people that are collecting benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately when that last beneficiary passes, the goal is to have you know, enough dollars in the trust fund to be able to make those benefit payments. At some point, um, it's likely that 
you know, the, the assets in the trust fund would, would go to zero. That, that's sort of the, the goal mm -hmm. in, in all of this. But not until yes. the last beneficiary gets paid. Absolutely. Yes, I, to add. Uh, I was going through the files and found a report and study done by Davenport that uh, they had recommended discretionary management and the pension obligation bonds and so forth, and they had said uh, no adjustments until you're at least 80% funded. Thank you. Mr. Battle, so you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So at the onset of sovereignty, after we made the loan, we were at 266 million approximately yes from the statistics she gave me so at June of uh, 2020 at 211 million that means that we had uh, lost 20 percent of what we had then we go over to your percentages and I see you have 4.8 down to 4.9, and it takes a little over 7% to maintain. Correct. So we lost about 7 or 8 million in 17. We lost about, we maintained, that was 18, we lost about 7 or 8 million. We maintained in 218, we lost another seven or eight into 20. And then we come up and we've made 29% uh, in 21. But how does that carry us up to 75%? So I, I was doing- And let me ask another yeah. question. Sure. Um, I do some investing. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not licensed to tell anybody that's licensed what to do. But in this day and time, things have changed. And uh, when cities invest, usually uh, the investors only make money when the city makes money. But. Uh, the uh, investors are making money here, whether we invest, I mean, whether we make money or not. And I kind of read through the contract that we have with y'all, and there's a clause in there that you're able to invest your monies uh, on something that you think is hot for us, and if it makes money, you get half of the money that it makes, and if it loses money, we take the whole fall. What I'm saying is, is this the best plan for us, or do we need to move into uh, you make money if we make money? Uh, are we in an antiquated contract here and we need to kind of move into uh, the contracts of the, this day and time. Thank you for those questions. I'll um, tackle maybe the, the last one first yes. and then, then come back yes. to the other one. Um, I'm not exactly sure what part of the contract you're referencing where um, you have all the downside um, and we get half of the fees if it works out. I, I can tell you the things we, in, we invest in. We don't invest in anything like that. We invest in public stocks and bonds. We do a little bit of real estate. The only fee that we receive is 10 basis points on the market value of the assets on which we advise. That's it. Um, the contract, by the way, dates back to 2018. Um, the end of 2018. So that's, um, I, I would imagine, the, the language in the contracts today are very similar to what the language was in, in 2018. So I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't know to what you're referencing. Now, so that 29%? Yes. Doesn't mean 
29% in two, true money, it means Correct. for that year. Correct. And it doesn't take into account the years that we lost. Correct. Oh, okay. thank you. But let, let me address, uh, because I, I did some of the math yes, um, when I was sitting, sitting over there. Yes. Where we started with, and I forget the numbers, and, and I apologize, but after the pension obligation bond, I think you said there were $266 million. Yes, sir. Um, and, and yet we're down from that level, right? I think. At um, 2.11. And we're, we're at 2.11. So I think what's missing from the analysis is the fact that we pay out $30 million every year. So 30 million times about 10 but, is $300 million. But we were just told we pay out $1.2 million a year. No, you pay out $30 million a year in benefits. <laughs> oh my goodness. In, in benefits, not expenses, oh, oh, in benefits, okay. in benefits. Okay. So, so that's what, that is the biggest impact on the decline in market value. So yes, the market value goes down. Doesn't mean the investments lost money. Right. It means we're paying out more um, than we can earn in investments. But if we're to make 7.1 million, I mean 7.1% yearly, we maintain, we would have maintained the solvency of 78%. The, so when, when the pension obligation bond was issued, Mr. Stewart did some um, forecasting about what is expected to happen to the funded status. And I asked him before this meeting, I said, hey, do you know back in 2013 when you did the forecast, what you were projecting the funded status to be now, back eight years ago. And he said, yes, it was, we thought it was gonna be 75% funded. It's 78% funded. So we're doing better than what the original forecasts were. Mr. Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank you. I, th I think uh, the, the question was asked earlier about with uh, perhaps a recession around the corner Yes. Uh, with a volatile market, uh, should the city increase its contribution? And, and what, what would your recommendation be? Well, um, I, I, I would say this. To, um, to the extent that there is um, cash to contribute over and above what Andre says, the seven to eight million dollars, yes, we think it would be a good time to do it because markets are depressed. Anytime you could put in more money into the market when things are temporarily depressed, that means we can buy stuff at lower prices and markets eventually recover, and that would be a good thing. So, um, so that, that's how I would uh, respond to that. Yes. And, and the other point uh, on the uh, obligation bonds, yes. a portion of that money was used for the social security offset to, to do away with that uh, back, back in the day. I forget what that amount was. Uh, I know perhaps uh, nine million comes to mind. I'm not certain, but I think that's an important factor. That, that all didn't go into the uh, pension plan at the time. I'm, I'm not aware of those numbers, but yeah. it would have an impact. Sure. sure. Ma'am, ma'am, if you could please come to the mic so we can all hear you. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's okay. Don't project. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that 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 Social Security offset is really built built into the formula of the liability. So you know, it wasn't a separate pot. It was all, all built in. So that's reflected in the yes, system. yes, it was all built into these numbers. Thanks. And I, I want you know just to. Uh, been working with this for a while now and uh, I know that you have money the market value increases from the investment earnings you pay out 30 million dollars a year in benefits um, uh, roughly a million dollars in expenses to these folks uh, John Hancock pays the retirees handles the w-2s handles all the reporting uh, great service to the city and uh, Greystone handles the investment management 
Uh, so those are important factors to the success, the overall success of this system that we have today. Yes, sir. No, the, the presentation has been excellent because a few meetings ago it was indicated that maybe our uh, funding w was a lot lower than uh, it actually is. So this should be good for any retirees watching the presentation to have confidence that uh, our pension plan is actually, I think your figure said, uh, better than uh, the national average. Uh, no retiree should have to worry. Exactly. That there is adequate money to pay. That these liabilities are estimated for the remaining life of the the, um, the retirees. You know, it could be 40 years, and so we, it's kind of like a mortgage. You you pay something every year, but you really owe 200 million, uh, 200 thousand. That that's the same analogy. You're not. It, it's not due today. Right. Thank you. Be, before I recognize Mr. Battle, is there anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? Who wants the floor, Vice Mayor Barnes or Councilman Woodard? Would you like the floor, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Battle, you have the floor, sir. I pass, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I had a question. I oh, well, Councilwoman Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor, and then Dr. Whitaker. Okay. And I, I guess this question is for Ms. Phillips. Um, we we see here that they gave you the the um, the task of giving us the expense overview for Greystone, John Hancock, and we see what those total expenses are. Yes, um, but we got a total of 1.2 million for all providers. And could you just give us a sampling of some that of the investors? That is what goes to the fund managers. Right. Just any time you um, buy an investment, you, there are fees associated with that. Right. So, but and they that mentioned. does not go through John Hancock or through Greystone. Okay. And the 1.2 million comes from some other um, investors that that act on comes behalf out of the of city. The system. It's okay. paid from the system. Okay. It, it, so these numbers that you're seeing are all net of all of that. Right. Yeah. But the 1.2 million, we was trying to. Um, well, I was trying to. Well, it was a. It, it's the numbers I showed you for them plus around 800,000 more. Right. Exactly. But that's what. We, uh, who are some of those investors that act on behalf of this plan for us. I have to turn over to uh, Brian to talk about the individual fund managers that receive some of that. Just a sampling of some of the people who are working on behalf of the plan. Um, that that manage actually manage the assets yes. for the city? Okay. Right. Um, so BlackRock is one of our fixed income managers. Right. Um, they they um, buy individual bonds um, and their their fees I think ten or eleven basis points. Right. Um, there's Rice Hall James, which is a well known growth manager out in California. Um, we use by the way a lot of um, what's called um, exchange traded funds. Okay. So mm -hmm. exchange traded funds are a really low cost way of getting um, broad diversification to different capital markets and assured market returns. Right. Okay, yeah, that's what I was looking for. And, and if their uh, fee rates, uh, the base points, were kind of similar to what you all get when they're... Um, the, so the, the investment managers get a little bit more money. On, on average, they they about 42 basis points. Okay. Um, I, I think it's interesting if you looked at, and there's not a lot of good information on this but mm -hmm. hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sense but once you um, factor in all investment management fees paid by other public retirement systems and the way they invest their money the average fee for a public fund is closer to one percent mm -hmm. uh, and we're paying about 40 low 40s mm -hmm. so we aggressively negotiate the fees on behalf of the city and we've been able to bring those down quite considerably. Okay. Very good. That answered my questions. Um. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yeah, so I didn't know if um, Ms. was trying to respond to. Well, she, she was, but you had had your hand up first. So if you would like to yield to. Um, I, I didn't know if she was manager. responding to Councilwoman Burke. Yes. Um, thank you so much. What I, would, what I could also provide is during our quarterly meetings, we have a printout that identifies the different um, companies that do this on our behalf. So I would uh, be happy to provide that information to you so that you can see each one of them and what their investment portfolio looks like. 
That was perfect. perfect. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. You have the floor, sir. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this question is for uh, you, Mr. Uh, Birnbaum, or whoever. Um, I noticed that there's a, a piece that um, we haven't really discussed and I uh, haven't heard generally when we've had presentations and considering that you have had to deal with uh, several state uh, pension funds. I'm just curious, what, what is the measure um, that is used uh, or standard uh, that is used to determine uh, whether these investments are being done in a way that is dealing with organizations that are socially uh, conscious. Um, there's a lot of discussion around the country right now and legislation that is attempted to be in pass that impacts on um, the green issue. And so I'm just curious, where I, I've never heard that reported as far as how do we control for making sure that our investments are being done with organizations that uh, represent uh, values that I would say are consistent with issues of social justice and community enhancement. You're, you're absolutely correct. There's been an incredible trend towards what's referred to as impacting or Im impact investing, or you might hear the term ESG, that stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. So investing in companies that have a strong track record of taking care of the environment, that have um, diverse boards of directors, all those things. Um, every investment manager out there is starting to incorporate though that lens into what they do from an investment perspective. So I, I would tell you that um, more and more of that is being captured um, in our portfolio. Um, and I would expect more and more continue to be incorporated in, in our portfolio. So right. hopefully, um, Dr. Whitaker, that answers your, your well, question. Well, my question is, how, how do we know that? And, and what is the, the measure that's used to determine that that is occurring because we don't normally have that type of information submitted. So we, we can run a report and we're happy to, to run it. We, we haven't um, uh, done it lately, but it, it can look at across the entire portfolio what our exposure is to things like carbon or what our exposure is to things like um, you know, having companies with diverse leadership and diverse boards, those kinds of things. So we're, we're happy to run that analysis for you and, um, and share that with the retirement board and then they can, can share it with you. Because that'll give you a, a, um, an objective measure, not, not just me standing up here and saying, well, it, it's right. being more incorporated. It'll give you actually a, 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 an objective measure. And, and how soon would a report like that be able to be generated? You already have a query that can do that? We can um, set it up. It'll probably take a week or two at most. Okay. Yep. If, Mayor, if there's um, no uh, objection from council or consensus, I would uh, like for council to uh, get that information. Madam City Manager, would you address that, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I will work with Grace Stone as well as Jan John Hancock to provide to receive that information. It's interesting because when we were meeting, we were looking at those types of things. But um, I ask that we just hold back and provide that information later because I know at times we don't like to be compared to other organizations and I wanted to make sure that we had the correct information to provide. So two weeks, I will, within two weeks, I will work with them to provide that information. And then if there's anything you want to add to that, just let me know and we can do it all together and provide one report. Well, also now that we have um, our advisors before us, I will hope that will become a standard part of your report that you would give that yep. information as part of your re standard report that Absolutely. you give to any council. Absolutely. All right. Vice Mayor Barnes and then Council Men Battle. Yes, sir. And Councilman Battle, yes. sir, you have the floor. 
I'm looking at the numbers from 213 to 221, and with the losses and the gains, um, I'm not getting 75% solidity. But if you're talking about for 2021, 75%. Sovereignty. I, I get that, but if we're adding all the years in um, of the losses and the gains, I'm, I'm not getting that figure of 75%. Funded status is a point in time. Um, sorry. What I'm saying is, um, we didn't make money every year. We lost money most of those years when we had a good market. And now we got a bad market. Uh, in one year, we made 29%, but that doesn't bring us back up to where we were. If you uh, translate the percentages into the actual numbers for that, those particular years, you understand? Um, oh. I, I think that's probably a, a question for, for Andre. Uh, we, we don't do the funded oh, status okay. calculations. Okay. Andre, did you want to come and address this question? Sure. Okay. What, let me say it so you can understand it better, possibly. From the onset of you being our investment partners. Each year, you have a list of the percentages uh, made. Uh, one year, you had 1.7. One year, you had 1.2. You had 12. You had 14. You had a 7.4, 7.8. And then we're down 20% of where we were once we made the loan. So you made 29% last year, and I, I don't, the numbers don't match the losses to bring it up to 75% sovereignty. So the, there are two components to the funded status. There's the assets and the liabilities. And the funded status is simply the liabilities divided by the assets in the plan. So while the assets are doing, or while the assets are performing as they are, sometimes overperforming the 7.25 percent, sometimes under. Andre, excuse me. Could you speak more clear into the mic yeah, so we I can just hear? Yeah, I realized I was thank far you. from it. Thank <laughs> you. So we're all the funded percentage is is dividing the value of the assets by or by the liabilities or the liabilities by the assets. So if the assets are 75 million dollars and the liabilities are $100 million, then the plan is, or vice versa, if the liabilities are um, $100 million and the assets are $75 million, then the plan is 75% funded. The assets are going to do what they do. They're going to, going to um, sometimes they're going to return 10%, sometimes they're going to return 5%, sometimes they're going to return negative 5%. But what I do as an actuary is look at the assets at a given point in time and the liabilities at that same point in time and divide one by the other. It's, it's that simple. And with respect to the, um, the benefit payments leaving the plan and causing the assets to decline, that's just a simple function of the amount of retirees that you have in the plan and the amount of benefits that need to be paid. And as a, as a simple example, you think of one person, say someone named Mark Jones that has a 401k balance of a million dollars, and they want to you know, draw $500,000 a year, even though they don't have the wherewithal to do that, then you would tell them, well, you need to make 50% return on that balance so that, the, so that your assets don't decline. So it's a, it's a similar situation. You have significant benefit payments in relation to the assets. So the asset values declining by $40 million, I believe, is not an indication of poor investment returns. 
it's just an indication of significant cash flows out of the plan. And, and see, uh, that's my point. If we make 7% and we're paying out more than we're making, and we've done that for several years, how do we rectify being 75% solvent? You see what I'm saying? Uh, Mr. Uh, could you hold just a second? Um, city manager, could you address that, please? OK, so just so uh, I don't want, I see like people are looking like at me a deer in headlights. What I just want to come across is that as the fund grows, our, we still have people retiring every year. So if the fund was not making more money or over and above, we would be paying out even more. But right now, as the fund makes money, we're putting out just as much in expense payments or benefit payments. Yes, we have an increase. If we did not make the money that we were doing, or as the fund continues to grow, or we have a return on our investment, it would be even more that we would be putting out or losing. And that's my point. If that's the case, how do we justify being 75% solvent at this time when you're constantly mentioning uh, more uh, liabilities that I didn't even add into the equation that I've done? Right, because in 2021, the, the system was able to see a bigger return. And so and, that's and, money that's invested back into the system. And that's what I'm saying. That return wasn't large enough to uh, erase the liabilities from the previous years. And the caveat that you're saying, which is, yeah, we make 7%, but we're paying out more. Right, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying. But but in 21, it was 85% funded. We're at 78%. You get you get more. You pay out more. What, what? But if we would want to have a one-on-one -on -one session with you to go over these numbers to give you a level of comfort, we are very very excited to be able to do that with you. I, I think in the interest of time and the other items we need to cover, that would be the preferred way to move forward. So gentlemen, unless there are any other questions, I thank you for your time, uh, your expertise, and we appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam City Manager. The next item is a legislative update by Sherry Neal. Hi, Ms. Neal. Good to see you. It's great to see everyone. Yes, ma'am. So, good evening, Mayor good evening. Glover, members of council, Madam City Manager. This evening, my presentation is going to initially focus on the outcomes of our 2022 General Assembly legislative initiatives and the statewide public policy initiatives that we took a, a stance on, highlighting a few of the ones that council showed a particular interest in. I'll end with talking about briefly preparations for the 2023 uh, legislative session and ask any questions that uh, you may have at that time. So our first initiative that we went forward with was um, suggesting that a supplemental program be established for the reduction of the tolls. The current toll reduction program is only good for people who have an annual salary of $30,000 or less for Norfolk and Portsmouth residents. So the thought here was to create another supplemental program for those people who generate 45000 to 30000 annually a year, and that money would be paid by the General Assembly using ARPA funds 
initially and then followed up with money from the general fund. But what we found out during session is that the ARPA funds could not be used for this particular program, a supplemental program, because the problems with the tolls existed prior to the pandemic, is what we were told. So <clears throat> we also found out that there may be some problems with the current program as it stands, and especially since when the new contract was um, taken over with ERC, the amount of money that was put into that fund increased from $500,000 to $3.2 million. And <clears throat> there's no data that we were able to put our hands on at the time to substantiate how this program is being marketed currently and how many people from Portsmouth and how many people from Norfolk are actually participating in the program. Therefore, the chairs of both the committees had decided to hold this particular piece of legislation over to the 2023 session, possibly, and had committed to sending a letter to VDOT requesting these metrics and this data from VDOT. Hopefully, we're looking to try to get this information back by the 1st of November so that determinations can be made whether or not to try to go forward with something similar to this or to try to correct problems that exist in the current program. At this time, the letters have not gone over there yet. Uh, as you may know, well know, we went from a regular session into a special session. The special session continued on because of the budget. The budget was just agreed to by the governor about a week or so ago with the General Assembly. With the General Assembly. And the General Assembly is still in special session at this time. And they're going to go back in September to deal with Supreme Court judges. So I'm still working closely with Senator Lucas's office and with Delegate Scott's office to try to make sure that these letters do go over to VDOT so we can secure that information in a timely manner. The next uh, two initiatives we're dealing with City of Portsmouth, city charter changes. The House versions of those bills failed to pass in the House. They did not get out of committee in the House. The Senate versions, the companion bills, did pass in the Senate. We were able to get them over into the House. They passed out of the House, and they were killed on the House floor on a party line vote. The next item was the Emergency Shelters Upgrade Assistance Fund. Uh, to just remind you, this is a particular fund that was conceived here by staff in Portsmouth and marshaled through with the help of our dele delegation members at the General Assembly working in conjunction with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. What we were needing to do with this particular fund, uh, the legislation, is to have the language amended so that local governments that run but do not own their emergency shelters would be able to participate in this grant program as well. The second thing we were looking at doing is trying to get the fund increased again. Right now, the fund is that we were able to get it at $2.5 million annually. We were successful in getting the language changed. Um, it was thought, however, that the $2.5 million that's currently in the fund was sufficient for now and we will continue to see how it's going to be utilized going forward um, to see if maybe it should be increased at another time. Excuse me, Ms. Neal, yes. I have a question. On the 2.5 million um, for the emergency shelters, is that 2.5 million appropriated statewide or is that the locality or what is that? Okay, it's the grant fund and the fund itself is grant is 2.5 million a year available for matching grants. Okay, very good, okay. thank you. Certainly. The next uh, request in our, our legislative package was to increase the Port Host Communities Revitalization Fund. And to bring that back to your memory as well, this is another fund that was uh, conceived and spearheaded by Portsmouth City staff. And working with our stakeholders and our delegation members, we were able to get this fund actualized into the city, into the state budget. This fund is a sub-fund of the Industrial Revitalization Fund, or IRF, as is noted there. 
the reason why we initially went after trying to con create this new fund for the porthole cities was because t traditionally the IRF fund was underfunded. And the localities who had larger swaths of land to develop for to business ready sites, they were the ones that were able to get these grants. And mo your port cities are older, they're built out, and we weren't able to access any of those grant funds. And after years of trying to get an increase in the payment in lieu of taxes from the Port Authority, it was thought that this will be a different route to try to get money to help us with our economic development activities as related with the port. So we were able to get this. It's been successful. We initially had it capitalized at a million dollars. We went back and asked for another half a million, which we got. It's in the budget for the state for three million dollars each year of which 1.5 million is available for grants specifically for the host cities of the port. However, what the General Assembly did do is they increased the funding for IRF using ARPA funds to over $50 million. With that group, that increase there, we are now able to actually compete for some of those funds as well as our port funds as well in the grant. So. Now turning to some of the state-supported public policy initiatives that we went forward with, that we advocated for or against. And on the chart, you'll see I've got a little bit of a legend. So the check marks are going to indicate those that were addressed and were successful. The little arrows indicate they, the issue was addressed somewhat, but not the way we uh, had envisioned it would be addressed, but something, some actions did happen on that. And of course, the excess means it wasn't addressed at all. So to the first one with the 599 funding, now that is a, it's called 599 funding, but it's money for localities that have police departments. So working along with our partners from Virginia First Cities and Virginia Municipal League, we were successful, and our delegation members, of course, we were successful in getting that 599 fund increased going forward into the uh, next biennium. The city of Portsmouth had received in FY20 about $6,435,000, I'm sorry, $6,435,546 in annual funding. So with the increases now for the next biennium, Portsmouth should receive $7,074,952 in 2023 and then $7,000,000 Three hundred and seventy-two thousand eighty-four dollars in 2024. The next item is the gun violence prevention through community. I mean, yeah, prevention programs. The General Assembly created the Firearm Violence Intervention and Prevention Fund and Operation Ceasefire Fund. Um, they placed $13 million from the general fund for grants supporting violence intervention and prevention, which includes $2.5 million each year for the Operation Ceasefire Grant and $4 million each year for Firearm Violence Intervention and Prevention Grant Fund. Included in this amount is $3 million designated for crime prevention through community engagement in localities with disproportionate rates of firearm violence. And out of that amount, 500,000 was designated specifically to the city of Portsmouth. The next item is K-12 education. We were supporting the Virginia Board of Education's resolution regarding the um, cap that had been placed on non-support SOQ positions. And we were looking for them to remove the cap in the budget and then to fully allocate the $387.8 million that would have made that a zero sum game, taking the impact off of local governments who are funding these programs. That was not done. But what was done was uh, the General Assembly put $109.4 million from the general fund in the first year and $162.3 million from the general fund in the second year to increase the number of funded support positions. Since fiscal year 2010, 
funded support positions have been calculated as a linear weighted average of supported positions to fund SOQ instructional positions as reported by the divisions. This would increase the funded ratio uh, from 17.75 support positions per 1,000 students to funded SOQ instructional positions to 20 support positions per 1,000 ADM to funded SOQ instructional positions in the first year and 21 support positions per 1,000 ADM to funded SOQ instructional positions in the second year. So this increases state support for support positions and partially removes the funding cap placed on support positions beginning in fiscal year 2010. The next item was, oh, and this is a side note, the General Assembly also approved, approved the 5% salary increase for instructional support positions throughout the state in the first year and at least an additional five in the second year, resulting in a combined increase of at least 10.25% during the biennium. The state funds excuse me, the state funds that the school division is eligible to receive shall be matched by the local government based on the composite index of local ability to pay. This local match shall be calculated for funded SOQ instructional and support positions using an effective date of August 1st, 2022, the first year and July 1st, 2023 for the second year. Local school divisions shall certify to the Department of Education that funds used as the local match are derived solely from local revenue sources. The next item is school modernization. Initially going in, we were supporting a 1% local option sales tax to have that occur. That did not happen. But what this General Assembly did do is they created a school construction grant program. So the first one, the language in the budget allows local school divisions to use school construction grants program funds for debt service payments on local school projects that have been completed or initiated during the last 10 years and clarifies that funds shall not be used for repair or replacement of parking lot or for facilities that are predominantly used for extracurricular athletic activities. Additionally, language clarifies that any unexpended funds shall be carried on the books of the, local, of the locality and local escrow accounts. So if that doesn't apply to us, then, <laughs> excuse me, allergies. They also created a school construction assistance program so this uh, budget amendment provides 400 million in the first year from the general fund and then 50 million in the second year from the literary fund to establish the school construction assistance program. And this provides competitive grants for school construction and modernization based on demonstrated poor building conditions, commitment, and need. Grants would cover 10% to 30% of reasonable project costs depending on a locality's local composite index and fiscal stress score. Portsmouth fiscal stress score is a 12, very high. So we should be able to get 30% on a construction grant from the state. The next item on that list was amending the, the uh, language dealing with African American cemeteries and graves by uh, expanding the definition of qualifying organizations, thereby allowing localities applying for the funding under the state fund even if they do not own the grave cemetery. That, that, that did pass. And not only did that pass, but uh, another bill passed along with that that changes the dates that qualifies the African American cemeteries for being historic. And it's been changed from cemeteries uh, or grave sites that were prior to January 1st, 1900, to now prior to January 1st, 1948. 
Um, and then, moving on, catalytic converters was an issue that was brought forward. And we did support that um, the state changed their code on catalytic converters to mirror that which what they were doing in North Carolina to make it a felony. So that legislation also passed. And so now, it's no longer a class one misdemeanor in Virginia. It's a class six felony. If the violation involves breaking, injuring, tampering with, or removal of catalytic converters or any of the parts. And then it also holds accountable the person who buys the scrap metal from um, whomever is trying to sell it. Preserving the and expanding the tree canopies, that passed. And so now local governments have that ability to do this as well. We were also looking for uh, uh, $50 million to be given to the Department of Forestry and Urban and Community Forestry Program to enable this to be, go forward. But it was decided by um, the General Assembly that, and those departments, that there was enough money probably in these two departments to handle this. So there was no need for extra money to be added to the budget, their budget. Dedicated transit funding for HRT and statewide transit needs and development of the higher speed rail, neither of those were addressed. However, what did happen was there was a uh, grocery sales tax that was eliminated by the state level um, and tax on personal hygiene items, which all of this goes into effect January 1st. The 1.5% of the state sales tax that has been eliminated, a portion of that went towards transportation and transit. So it is thought at this time that public transportation is going to take about a $194.8 million hit over the biennium with 54.8 million reduction in FY23. And that would be a 140 million reduction in FY24. That's for maintenance and road maintenance and things of that nature. As far as transit, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation is looking at a reduction of about 6.3 million in the first year and $15,596,369 in the second year. So that's going to be public transit, transportation agencies, uh, the rail, the port, and so on and so forth. Um, the last two items on there were addressed in various budget amendments. I'm not going to go through those, but the money has, was placed in those. Clean Chesapeake Bay, and I'm going to loop that with the funding assistance for Hampton Roads for recurrent flooding. What the General Assembly did is they created a resilient Virginia revolving loan fund. And the bill provides that funds can be used for loans or to refinance projects for local governments or to give grants to them. to deal with flood prevention and uh, resiliency projects. And also, the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund received $25 million for capital projects meeting all pre-requirements for implementation, including but not limited to new stormwater, best management practices, stormwater best management practices, retrofits, uh, stream restoration, low impact development projects, buffer restoration, pond retrofits, et cetera, et cetera. The Freedom of Information Act, there was, um, that wasn't directly this address for uh, um, councils such as yours to be able to meet electronically outside of a declared public emergency. But House Bill 722 was discussed and it failed. And that would have allowed a local public body that serves a, in an advisory capacity to gather uh, that way, um, and that, that was killed. So moving forward, next month, July, we will begin accepting any suggestions for the upcoming packages. Um, we'll do the research and get in preparation 
for the General Assembly. Pre-filing for bills begins on the 18th of July. We look to coming back at some time in September, come before council with the first draft. In November, all of the TBDs is to be determined dates um, to come back with our General Assembly delegation to meet with our final uh, package for council to adopt our packages by resolutions in November. And the last day to act on continued legislation which would impact our tow relief bill is November 21st. December, the governor will present his budget. Pre-filing deadline will be sometime in December. And then January 1st, the first session of Congress begins on the 3rd of January, and the 2023 General Assembly session begins on the 11th. And with that, I'll entertain any questions that you may have. And Dr. Try Whitaker, to answer. you have the floor, sir. So, so Ms. Uh, Neal, any charter amending needs to be done, uh, that needs to begin in July? in order to be part of the legislative package. Mayor Glover, Dr. Whitaker, yes, sir. I would say that you would need to, similar, similar to when you did it before, because you have to have a public hearing, mm -hmm. right, and it has to be a first day introduction. So it has to be ready to be introduced to the General Assembly on, on that first day. Right, and uh, also, just so the public is clear, the uh, charter, changes that were recommended, uh, the non-interference in appointments and also the recall provisions, those both pass the Senate. Yes. Were, was that vote along party lines as well? You remember? Yes. It, it was. So, so all of the Democrats in the Senate agreed with our charter amendment. I wouldn't quite say that they agreed with it. They, they uh, I would in say, favor however, of because of the sponsors, they supported it. Well, well the question is that they voted along party they lines. They voted along party lines. So if they voted along party lines, then all of the Democrats in the Senate voted in favor of our charter amendment. Technically, yes. <laughs> Not technically, they did. If all of them voted for it, <laughs> and then, on the flip side, all of the Republicans in the state of Virginia in the House of Delegates voted against our amendments because you said that was along party lines. The vote on the House floor, yes, it was on party lines. Right. Yes. So. And, and also, keep in mind that the way the committees are um, situated. Right. The majority committee rules the each committee, so you'll have more of one right. dem party on a committee than of the other. Right, so right, yeah. Right. But I just want to make it clear that the citizens know that it was a Republican effort. Well, we also had those. citizens that called up there and they spoke out against it. No, I'm talking about the vote. Oh, the well, vote yeah. went along. And I mean that helped the vote that helped them to vote against it. That's right. what so, I'm saying. But yes. I'm saying but the vote went along. The vote party on lines. the House floor went and on it party was clear lines. That all of the Democrats in the House voted for it. Yes. And all the Republicans voted against. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any, anything else? Ms. Snell. Yes. Thank you for all the work you do at the state level for the city of Portsmouth. We appreciate you, ma'am. Thank you very much. You guys have a good weekend and a great holiday. Absolutely. Madam City Manager. Uh, this brings us to our city CMR summary. Um, CMR 22191, um, an amendment to section 1093, 10-93, to change name and the voting location of precinct number five for the Hampton Roads Community Health Center to the Charles A. Fisher Memorial Academy located at 1725 Green Street. Uh, CMR number 22-192, an amendment to section 10-96 of chapter, charter of chapter 10 to change the code, to change the name and voting location of precinct number 10 from the Port Norfolk Recreation Center to the Mount Hermon Preschool Center located at 3000 North Street. 22-193, an ordinance to accept a grant in the amount of 584,189 
from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services and appropriating to fiscal year 23 grants fund to operation of local probation and pretrial services. 22-194, adoption of ordinance for jail diversion funding in the amount of 5451 from the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Departmental Services for the 2023 budget to assist in diverting individuals with mental health issues. 22-195, adoption of ordinance accepting donation to the Department of Social Services from Tabernacle Church in the amount of $1,000 to provide support for the food pantry. 22196, adoption of ordinance to accept federal grant funding in the amount of $460,000 into the fiscal year 22 Portsmouth Public Schools grant fund budget. 22198, Adoption of an ordinance to amend Article 1 of Chapter 12 by adding a new section 12-19 authorizing the city manager to accept funds or gifts or donations of $10,000 or less. 22-198, adoption of resolution authorizing the grant of underground utility easement to the Virginia Electric and Power Company having an approximate with width of 15 feet across a portion of 105 Utah Street. That is it for my reports. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any uh, council liaison reports at this time? Seeing none, then we do have a need for a closed session. And Councilwoman Lucas Burke. Miss, Mr. Mayor. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Do you um, have the floor? Yeah. Before we um, have the closed motion, Given the information that the uh, city attorney has shared with us in regards to the uh, city manager uh, search, I mean, not search, but um, background information, um, I would like to add the language to the motion that we used last night so that we can hear from the city attorney in our closed session as well. Madam city attorney, can you speak to that matter, please? Yes, it sounds that like council, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, it sounds like the councilman is asking to add a matter to the closed session. Um, and because that is a uh, special request, it has to be unanimous. So um, you'll need to vote on that. That is correct. And so um, at this time, I do not, I, 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 I would like to, um, we have a motion to add it. Is there a second? Because we have a motion. That's correct. Second. And could you call the roll? Just a minute, man. Just a, just a point of order. For a for a closed meeting, it has to be unanimous, or for a special meeting, it has to be unanimous. Let me let me check that. Right. My my what I uh, reported, I believe, is correct, but I will check that. Give me just a moment, okay. please. May I may have the floor? You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Councilman, um, you are asking just to confirm to add a matter to the agenda to the regular meeting. Is that what you're asking? No. No, this is for what we're going to discuss in closed session. And I know we have to have a unanimous vote if it's a special meeting to add to the agenda. But for Correct. a closed session item, um, we've added items before. Um, that doesn't require a unanimous vote. That just requires a consent of what council wants to discuss in closed session. That's correct. Okay. All right. That's correct. That is correct. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. But we still have to take on a vote to add that, that meeting 
Add See, that language to add the, that language and don't we are we still required to take a vote to add the meeting to the agenda since it wasn't order well, it wasn't added initially? Just, let me defer to the clerk. Just a point of order. The the agenda is not the regular meeting agenda, it's just what we're discussing in closed session. I, I understand that, sir, but it's still an agenda of a closed session meeting. It still has to we mm -hmm. need to just have it verified. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I'm going to defer to the clerk on this issue. She has the historical reference for what generally happens here um, with adding to the language of a closed session. So I defer to the clerk. Thank you, ma'am. Madam ma Clerk, you have the floor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mayor, members of council, um, in the past, if we wanted to add something to a closed session, um, there has not been an official motion and second and vote. Um, it was either just added or you just had a consensus from council. Right. But there has never been an official vote from the time that I've been here. Right. Thank you for the clarification. And so with that being said, um, we need a consensus to add the item to the agenda. It's a continuation of our discussion from yesterday, since the city attorney has advised us on additional information. It's, it's, the, it's the same topic, but she has additional information that she has to share in council. Are you all okay up there? Yes, sir. We're just confirmed that. Do you have the language from yes. the amended motion? Okay, yes. so you just need to read that, please. Okay, all right. Okay. Mr. Mayor, may I make the motion? You may make the motion, sir. I move to go, I move to go into closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A.3 for the purpose of discussing the acquisition of real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body, specifically regarding Lincoln Memorial Cemetery located at 3901 Deep Creek Boulevard and pursuant to Virginia Code subsections 2.2-3711A.1 and A.6 for the purpose of discussing and considering the city manager's contract. Is there a second? Second. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Vice Mayor Barnes? Yes. Mr. Battle? Yes. Mrs. Lucasberg? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Dr. Whitaker? Yes. Mr. Woodard? Yes. Mayor Glover? Yes. We are now in closed session. We have a need to certify coming out of closed session. Dr. Whitaker, do you have a motion? All right. I hereby move that each council member certify that to the best of his or her knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Second. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Vice Mayor Barnes. Yes. Mr. Battle? Yes. Mrs. Lucasburg? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Dr. Whitaker? Yes. Mr. Woodard? Yes. Mayor Glover? Yes. We're out of close and we are going to take a three minute break and we will resume um, the meeting in three minutes. <laughs> 